Hey, I want to welcome you if you're here for the first time. Can we get it up for our first time guests here in EHT? Can you welcome our Cumberland County that's tuning in over at Cumberland County and worshiping with us and celebrating with us? And can we also give it up for our online fusion family? We love you. We thank you for tuning in to us each and every single week and being a part of the Fusion family. Hey, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Jose Lopez. I have the incredible privilege of being the worship pastor. Can we give it up for our worship team at all of our locations that do such a phenomenal job leading us to worship each and every single week, if I do say so myself? Uh, But I have the incredible opportunity to lead them. Uh, This week, we are going to continue our series called, How Do I Know God's Will for My Life? Come on, can we read that together? How do I know God's will for my life? That is the question that we are seeking to answer over these next couple of weeks. Pastor Brendan, give it up. Give it up for Pastor Brendan. What an incredible leader we have did an incredible job of introducing the series last week where he introduced us to this graph here and it shows us how we can receive the revealed will of God by looking at it through the lens of his kingdom, looking at it through the lens of intuition, presence, uh, daily disciplines, our personal being, and then also in the lens of community and being a part of a community. If you missed that message, you want to go check that message out And you want to get familiar with this graph because it it really does tie in with today's message. But today we're going to continue today's message or series on how do I know God's will for my life? Look at the neighbor next to you and just ask him, how do I know God's will for my life? How do I know God's will for my life? We're going to answer that question because the truth is, the truth is that so many of us are impacted by that question. In fact, if you're like me, you could say that for most of your life, you have been consumed by that question. God, what is your will for my life? Another way to ask that question is, God, should I buy this house or should I not buy this house? Uh, Should I marry this person or should I not marry this person? God, should I pursue this career? God, should I go to this school? God, should I should I stay at this workplace or should I not stay at this workplace? Come on, can some of, can some of us relate to that? We're just trying to figure out what are the right things. It's okay, you can raise your hand. Cumberland County, raise your hand if you can relate to that question. Online, if you want, you can put a raised hand emoji in the comments right there. I think we could all relate in some way, shape, or form that we have been consumed by this question of God, what is your will for my life? And if you're honest, you could say you're one of two people on that spectrum. You are the person who's just genuinely trying to figure it out. You have no idea whatsoever what you want to do, how you should do it, when you should do it, if it's the right thing to do. But then there's another side of that spectrum that are, that are the people that are much like my wife when she asked me what dress she should wear. You know what I'm talking about if you're married, right? My, my wife, I love her. But my wife, she'll sometimes ask me a question that she already knows the answer to. She just wants to see how I will answer it, right? So she'll ask me, hey, babe, what, what, what dress do you think I should wear? Should I wear the navy dress or the floral print dress? And I'll say, babe, that navy dress looks amazing on you. You should wear that dress. She'll go, okay, I'm going to go with the floral print. Or maybe, maybe sometimes she'll, well, we're trying to figure out what we're trying to have for dinner and she'll say, hey, uh, babe, do you want pizza or would you like some Chinese? And if you know me, I am sick of pizza. If I see another pizza in my life, I will throw that thing as hard against the wall as I possibly can because I can't stand pizza. So I'll say, babe, I want some Chinese. And my wife will go, okay, I'm going to order some pizza. I'm like, why did you ask me the question if you already knew the answer to what you wanted to the question, and she'll say something like, well, I just wanted you to feel like you had some input. <laughs> and we laugh, but the reality is that most of us, we treat God that way. Well, God, I just want you to feel like you had some input in my life. Because after all, if I just give you just a little bit of input in my life, then maybe, and just maybe, I can feel good about this thing called Christianity. And, 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 but the problem is that with God, he can't just have a little bit of input in our lives. He has to be the input 
that only matters in our lives. The problem is that God is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. The problem is if I surrender some to God, I have surrendered nothing to God. And so I think if we're going to discover the will of God for our lives, we have to start there. That the will of God for our lives begins with surrender and submission. We just sang about it in the last song to worship God. We make room for you. And the problem that many of us face in our lives is that the room that we have for Jesus is a very limited amount of space where if Jesus begins to actually infiltrate any other space outside of that room, then we begin to feel like our life is out of control because after all, what we're trying to figure out is not whether or not uh, our plan fits in with the will of God. We're actually trying to see if God can actually mold his will around our plan. But God does not function that way. The reality is that what we need to do when it comes to the will of God is we actually have to figure out how our plans can fit around his will. And that begins with submission. So I think if we're going to start anywhere with trying to discover the will of God, we have to start with acknowledging that, number one, God is in control. And if he's in control, then God ultimately has a plan. I'm going to say that again. If we're going to begin to understand, know, and receive the revealed will of God for our lives, we have to both acknowledge that God is in control. And if he's in control, then ultimately he has a plan. Because he is the creator of the, heavens, of, the, and the, of the heavens and of the earth. He is the God who told the stars where to sit. He is the God who told the sea where to stop. He is the one of which he orchestrated every single thing that we could see. And if he is in control, then he ultimately has a hand. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Next part says, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I want to go back to the beginning of that where it says, for we are God's handiwork. Another version of the Bible says, we are his masterpiece. Can I just encourage you by telling you right now that you are not a mistake, you are not an afterthought, you are actually the handiwork of God. He has purposely formed you, shaped you, created you. He knows the number of hairs on your head before you were even in your mother's womb. He already had a plan for your life to do good works which he already prepared in advance for you to do. And so the best thing that we could do with our lives is to surrender to God because we trust him. We trust him with our lives. We trust him with our will. We trust him with our plan. We trust that his plans are always so much better. They're always so much more perfect than when you and I can actually pull it together and scheme up ourselves. The beauty of being a believer is that as believers, we have a father who is in control of all in heaven and on earth. But we also have a father that is beside us, that is leading and guiding us, directing us into the will of God for our lives. In fact, the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verse 23 says this. The Lord makes firm, read it with me, The steps of the one who delights in him. Let's read that again. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Here's my question for you. What are you delighting in? Are you delighting in that thing that will bring you pleasure? Are you delighting in that relationship you're looking to seek your identity in? Are you delighting in how much money you can raise in your bank account? Are you delighting in the career that you ultimately find all of your identity and your purpose in? What is it that you delight in? Because what you delight in will actually set the standard for the steps that you make. The Bible says that he makes firm, put it back up for me please, the steps of the one who delights in him. You delight in Jesus and your steps will be so firm that nothing will cause you to stumble, that nothing will shake up your life, that nothing will disturb uh, your access to what God has for you. But if you put your delight in the wrong thing, 
The Bible says that every other thing is sinking sand. So as long as that sand is sinking, so will your life. So maybe the reason why things seem so stable is because you have the wrong delight. Can we talk about it? Can we be real for a second? I've been in this place where I delight in things that aren't really worth delighting in. And I wonder why my life is such a hot mess. Why things seem so shaky. Why things don't seem so firm. Why things don't seem steadfast. And it's because I'm delighting in the wrong thing. He says, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Psalms chapter 32, verse 8. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Isaiah 58, verse 11. It says, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs. He will satisfy your wants. He will satisfy your pleasure. No, no, no. He will satisfy your needs. His needs are the mo- your needs are the most important thing. You see, the, the problem with the will, and I didn't say this in the first verse. I'm going to say it in the first service. I'm going to say it in this service. The problem is, here we go, okay? The problem is that God's will for our lives is not our happiness and our holiness. I'm sorry. God's will for our lives is not our happiness and our healthiness. God's will for our lives is our holiness. Ultimately, what God wants for you is not for you to be happy and healthy. Those are good things. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being fit. There's nothing wrong with being full of happiness. There's nothing wrong with things going well. But the truth is that God cares more about your holiness than he cares about your happiness. He cares about you being more like him and and serving him and your will not being so self-seeking, so self-pleasing, and so self-serving, but that your will would actually line up with his will because he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. Next verse, next section. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path, everybody say it, straight. You know what the problem is? We totally disregard that first section, the first section of that verse. It says, go back, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We have this false idea in our lives that our understanding is the ultimate truth. That our understanding is what matters the most. But God says, no, 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 forget about the things you can understand. Forget about the things that make sense to you. Forget about the things that make you feel comfortable. And instead, submit... In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. You know what the the path to the, the will of God is for your life? Through submission. The path to God's perfect will for my life is through submission. The Bible says, in all of your ways. You know what all means? All. Not some, not the ways that matter to me the most, not the ways that feel good, not the ways that seems to make sense. No, no, no. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Too many of us are leaning on our own understanding. We want to find out God's will for our lives while doing it with our own understanding of our very finite minds. And God says, no, 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 if you will trust me, if you would submit to me, if you would surrender, let me tell you, that's the hardest part. I'm in Enneagram 8. Pastor Brett and I are very similar. And they will tell you that the worst thing you could do to an Enneagram 8 is to try to control him. We don't like to be controlled. We don't like to be manipulated. We're very untrusting. Submission is probably the most difficult things for us. Because submission means I'm not in control. Submission is I have to put my trust in something else and declare something else to have authority in my life. 
And I don't like that because I like having authority over my life. I like being in control. I like having the one to be to be able to be the make one to be to be the one to make all the decisions in my life. But when it comes to submission, I think we could all be honest and say, no, no, I'd rather not do that. But submission is the only way to be able to actually get to where my paths are straight enough to where I can arrive to his will for my life. So how does God lead us to these paths? How does God direct our lives? How does God guide our lives? Well, the first way that I believe God leads us is by leading us through prayer. God leads us through prayer. And the reason why so many of us struggle with discovering what God desires for our lives is because we have not created a space for God to speak into it. We love clutter. We love noisy lives. We love distractions. We love all the noise, and we, we, we pretend we don't, but the truth is, if, if we just go through our phones for just a second, just go through your phone and look at your screen time, that'll tell you how much you love being distracted and how noisy your life is and how cluttered your life is and all the games and all the apps and all the, let's be honest, can we for a second? We want God to, to speak to our lives and to give us clear paths and to make our path straight, but we will not allow God enough access into our lives to create a space to where he can speak to us. And God is just saying, hey, can you just give me some room so I can tell you some things? Let's think about this practically for a second. My wife and I have great communication, I would say. She might tell you otherwise, but she don't have the mic. I'm just kidding. We have great communication. Could you imagine if our entire marriage was consumed with nothing but me constantly talking about my desires, my wants, what I want her to do, and how she makes me feel, how she doesn't make me feel? Could you imagine how one-sided that relationship would be? That's how one-sided many of our relationships with God is. And you cannot have a fruitful relationship without having some faithful communication where both parties are speaking into a situation or speaking into the relationship and both parties have access and freedom to communicate freely between one another. Well, you cannot have a fruitful relationship with God if you are not allowing and creating access to God for him to speak into your life for your spiritual relationship, for your spiritual well-being to flourish in that relationship with God. So I think the best thing that we could do to discover God's will is create some space where God can speak into our lives. And I believe that the, one of the best ways that God speaks to our lives is by giving us peace. In fact, the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, it says this. Do not be anxious about anything. Let's read it together. But in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's put that, for, that for, um, second section back in there, please. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. One of the greatest ways that God can lead you into his will is by giving you a peace that surpasses all understanding. I remember years ago, uh, my wife and I were trying to figure out what we were going to do with our lives. And uh, I was working for Walgreens at the time. I had been working for Walgreens for 10 years. Um, I, I worked myself up from being a service clerk into a photo tech, from a photo tech into the pharmacy tech, from a pharmacy tech back onto the floor. And they promoted me to be the overnight uh, assistant store manager. Then I got promoted to an assistant store manager over a whole store. And I was a second in command, all that wonderful jazz. I was making a, 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 a nice amount of money. It was a great career to have, but I was the most miserable I would ever be. 
And I had no plan. I had no degree. I didn't go to college. I had no idea what to do. I just worked really hard to get promoted in this establishment. It was the first and only job I had. And as my wife and I were praying, I felt the Lord say, it's time to go. I'm like, what do you mean it's time to go? I ain't got no plan. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to provide for my family? He's like, no, 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 it's time to go. And I just felt this peace. And my wife and I would pray about it, and we're like, okay, I think God is really pushing us to go. And we had this peace that did not make sense. I had no plan whatsoever, no idea what to do. I left Walgreens, which ultimately led me into an establishment where the boss of the real estate office would pay for me to get my real estate license. And I did real estate, did really good in real estate for a few years. But that ultimately led to a, put, put, a, put me in a place where I could start a church called Versa Church, which is now a part of Cumberland County. Come on, shout out Cumberland County people. Woo! Which ultimately led to me being a worship pastor here at Fusion. What am I trying to tell you? That if you would just put your trust in God and give God a space for him to speak and give you some peace in your life, you'll actually be able to allow him to walk you through this journey to a place where you could actually get to a point where God, you could look back and like Moses say, I know God was with me back here because I'm standing on the mountaintop. And no, it doesn't make sense. It's a, it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. Sometimes God moves in things that don't make sense. Sometimes the path to his will doesn't make sense. When you look at the story of Joseph, God reveals his will and his plan for Joseph's life. And he says to Joseph, you're going to be somebody who's high up. Your family's going to be bound down to you and everything. And then Joseph ends up being sla- sold into slavery. And then from being sold into slavery, he ends up being accused uh, for sexually abusing Potiphar's wife. And it was false, but he ended up in prison anyways. And then from the prison, he ends up in the palace. What am I trying to tell you? That God's will sometimes does not make any sense, but will ultimately be accomplished. But can you trust him to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding? Now, what am I not telling you? Do not go to your job tomorrow morning, cuss your boss out, and say, I'm out. That's not what Pastor Jose is saying. Do not go back to your yard tomorrow and be like, Pastor Jose said, I could just tell you off and I'm out of here because I got the peace of God. No, that's stupid. Right? What I'm asking you to do is to just seek God, create some room for God to give you some space. Or create some space for God to speak into your life where he can give you some peace, but he can also give you some wisdom. Because the book of James tells us this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God's not trying to keep some secrets from you. God will actually give you some wisdom which is what you actually need to be able to make some decisions. Because some of us have been staying stagnant trying to figure out what God's will. And God's just saying, hey, if you would just take my wisdom, you can actually make a decision here. And if you create some space for God to speak, then he could give you his wisdom. The second way that God speaks to us is that God speaks to us and leads us through his word. God speaks to us and leads us through his word. Let me tell you something, there's nothing more vital for your life in trying to discover God's will for your life than to develop a daily discipline of studying and reading through his word because his will will never contradict his word. I'm going to say that again. His will would never contradict his word. So when the Bible says that you should not be unevenly yoked, I don't care how you feel about that relationship. His will for your life never contradicts his word. Oh, but he's so sweet. Oh, but he bought me some flowers. Oh, he's got so much potential. Potential is nothing but wasted energy. His will never contradicts his word. 
That's why the best thing that you could do for your life. God, what, what do you want me to do? Okay, let me, let me open up this word. And let me see what your word says. And then once I see what your word says, God, help me to figure out how I can I apply it to my life. The book of Timothy. Paul tried to stress this to his disciple, Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, it says this. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for what? Teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be, let's read this together, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's his word that prepares you for his will. It is word that equips you for his will. It's his word that corrects you. It's his word that challenges you. It's his word that teaches you. It's his word. His word is a safeguard. Listen to me. If you would like to find out how you can stay in the will of God, then stay in the word of God. Because when you're going to make the wrong decision, it says, no, 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 boo-boo, don't do that. And when you're doing the wrong thing, it says, Jose, you, you know you shouldn't have done that. You better go make that right. And when I'm unsure and I don't know, and it, it teaches me to make the right decisions and to look at the right things and to say no to the wrong things. His word is effective and trains me up in righteousness to be able to do every good work. In fact, the book of Psalms, chapter, one, uh, uh, chapter 119, verse 105, it says this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know why so many of us have suffered with confusion and, and uh, a lack of wisdom and even some pain in our lives? is because we're trying to walk in the dark. You ever try to walk in the dark in the middle of the night? The other day, I, so I've been... The truth is, I've actually been trying to recover from a sickness this past week. Pray for me, y'all. And, and, and uh, the other day, I woke, it was so bad, my eyes were gunked up shut, like gunked shut, and I couldn't open them, and I had to walk to the bathroom like this, right? And then one of those moments, I actually stubbed my toe. Bah, like, oh, oh. And I swear to you, I want to say every cuss word I could think of, but the Holy Spirit said, don't you dare. I'm like, yes, Lord, I bless your name, Jesus, right? <laughs> but the reality is that's, that's the problem with many of our lives is we're trying to walk in the dark, trying to figure out, God, where do you want me to go? And bah, oh, that one cost me. And we're trying to figure out, God, what do you want me to do? And oh, I tripped here. And that is because we will not open the word of God up and allow it to light the lamp to be the lamp that lights the path for me to where I know, oh yeah, I'm not gonna step on that one. Oh no, I'm not gonna trip there. Oh no, I'm not stubbing my toe, devil, because that's painful. And the best thing that we can do to avoid pain in our lives is we're trying to discover what God wants for our lives. It's to actually open up the lamp of God's word and allow it to light up our paths. That's why when you walked into the room today, you probably found this card, it's called the 40 day challenge. If you don't want to use this one, you can use the soap card. It's fine. But either one, if you could just develop a discipline of studying and reading God's word every single day. Listen to me. 15 minutes for 40 days will change your life forever. Now, don't stop at the 40 days. And if you're already a seasoned Christian and you've been through the 40-day challenge, that's fine. Find somebody that you can give this to that's struggling with their identity, whatever the case may be. But if you would just devote 15 minutes to, to reading God's word and doing your soaping, scripture, observation, application, and prayer, for the next 40 days, I promise you, if you come back to me in 40 days and tell me that your life hasn't been changed, hasn't been renewed, hasn't been strengthened, that you haven't grown in, in your faith with God, then I'll tell you I'm a liar to your face. I promise you, you won't be able to do that. Because his word... It leads us, it guides us, it directs us. But the third way that God leads and guides and directs us is through community. Too many of us are trying to figure this thing out on our own. 
Too many of us are trying to figure this thing out and depending on our own wisdom and our own understanding and our own knowledge and our own strength and we're, and we're failing and we're struggling and we're giving in to anxiety and hopelessness and, and despair because we're trying to fight for it on our own. Here's what the book of Proverbs chapter 15 verse 22 says. Plans fail for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. Ever wonder why it just doesn't work out? God, I keep, I keep screwing it up. God, it keeps getting messed up. I just, nothing, nothing I do ever works out. It's because plans fail when you lack a group of people that are like-minded, that are seeking God's face, that are creating space for God to speak, that are opening up the scripture and allowing wisdom to come forth. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15 says this, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. And you may wonder why your pastor said, oh, I don't think, that, I don't think that's a good idea. And you're like, no, pastor, I think it's a great idea. God spoke to me, okay. Okay. And you could throw the card on. And we've been there. Come on. You could throw the God card on there all you want. The way of fools seems right to them. Let me tell you something. Your way will always seem right. I promise you. Your way will always seem right. But the wise listen to advice. Look at this one, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. There's safety. You want to know how you discover God's will? Surround yourself with some people that are filled with the Holy Spirit who open up the scriptures every single day. In fact, they need to be people who read the Bible more than you do. That can provide you with some safety through some counsel. You know how many things Natalie and I have avoided in our lives because we have, listen to me, I promise you, even our, even our decision for me to leave Walgreens was not done by ourselves. We have always had pastors, mentors, people in our lives that we could walk things through with and say, hey, what do you think about this? And some of those people will be like, no, that's a really dumb idea. You don't want to go there. But more often than not, they are so full of the Holy Spirit to say, yes, you know what? If God called you to do it, you need to be faithful and obedient to what God is asking you to do. It may not make sense. It may not feel good. You might be broke for a little bit, but God's going to take care of you. But there's also those times where people say, hey, Jose, that's not God's will for your life. And in that moment, we say, you know what? I trust you enough, and I trust the Holy Spirit enough in you to say that I'm going to take that into consideration. I'm going to listen to what you say, and I'm not going to move until the Holy Spirit speaks to both of us. And that's okay. But you need some people in your life that are going to make you better, that are going to make you stronger, that are going to speak some wisdom into your life because you don't have the answers to everything. And that's why God places people in your life. And listen to me, they got to be godly people because you can't allow everyone to speak into your life. I'm not talking about surrounding yourself with some yes men. I'm talking about surrounding yourself with some Holy Spirit filled people. That aren't going to worry about hurting your feelings. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let me leave you with some application points. The first one is what is your Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? How is God leading you in this moment? What's He speaking to you? What's He asking you to lay down? How is he asking you to submit and surrender? The second one is this. How can I establish a daily rhythm of prayer and Bible study in my life and make some space and some room for God to speak to me, to give me his peace and to give me some wisdom? But the third one is this. 
Do I have a community of godly spiritual people that can speak wisdom into my plans? Because that's ultimately what we need. Let me pray for you, God. We just thank you. God, we thank you for your wisdom. God, we thank you for your peace. God, we thank you that we never have to walk this life alone. God, we thank you that you formed us and you shaped us, that you have made us your handiwork and your masterpiece. God, that you have a plan for each and every single person in this church, in this building right now. God, I pray that you would continue to speak to them. But most importantly, God, that we would be able to submit to your plans. God, that we would make room for you as you as you lead us, as you guide us, as you direct us. And God, I pray that every single purpose will live according to your will, to your plan, because your will and your plan are perfect and your promises are yes and amen. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen.